Thanks, Ali. Hi, everyone. Um, so nice to be here. Thank you so much, Kia Ora. Thanks for inviting me. Um, it's a beautiful landscape that you have. I've enjoyed getting to know the, the, the country a little bit so far and looking forward to much more. Um, myself, growing up, um, my family used to really take a lot of trips, family car trips, road trips, to always plan around seeing the landscape in North America. And at least that's what my dad always said. He was an engineer and I think he really just wanted to go see bridges. <laughs> Highest bridge, lowest bridge, longest bridge. It seemed like we were always looking at bridges. This is the causeway at Lake Pontchartrain and it was like bliss, bridge bliss for my dad. Um, but I think that's eventually what led me to architecture is this kind of love of both structure and landscape. And I started my practice in Chicago which has had a strong influence on me and all the other projects that I've done later on. Um, it's the home of the Burnham Plan. The Burnham and Bennett did a plan for Chicago in 1909 that was part of the City Beautiful movement. Um, and it really was about um, repairing uh, this uh, urban environment that had been subject to very quick industrial development. And it was... Um, it kind of, I guess it was kind of a mess, but it was really the center of, of all the rail. Um, and the reason why it was so important for industry at that time in the late 1890s, you see the lakefront there, um, is because of the fresh water resource of the Great Lakes. And um, you know, this is an, an incredible uh, freshwater ecosystem. It's the largest one in the world. It's 21% of all fresh water on the planet is right here in these lakes. Um, and so, and Lake Michigan, of course, is where Chicago is, which was called um, Lake Michigami by the Ojibwe who lived there first. And what happened though, is that Burnham's plan never really planned for the exit of industry. Like what would happen if everything left and went somewhere else, which it did. Um, and so this is the, the legacy is really this rust belt, um, a kind of former industrial polluted lands, a lot of uh, they call Superfund sites, which are you know, ha heavily polluted, that stretches across nine states and dozens of cities. So um, fast forward to today, I think we're in a moment of repair again. We have to, I think architecture is really, needs to be about how are we going to move forward um, with ecology, with biodiversity, and connecting people again to the land and to each other? Um, and so one of my very, very first projects we did was the, um, this community center in Calumet. It was a competition that we won. And I think the lessons from this competition have been carried out in different scales and different ways uh, throughout our practice. Um, it, it was set in this industrial um, landscape that's not a hill in the background, it's actually a landfill. And, and you know, it's a kind of a place that, while at one hand it's very polluted, on the other hand it's been uh, beneficial for certain species uh, to take hold because it wasn't a, a planned monocultural like lawns and suburbia, it's really more of a kind of mix of wild areas and water landscapes and former industrial places. And so um, in this place, we were designing a community center uh, based on this idea of connecting people more to each other and introducing green jobs and, and making uh, people f f under be connected to their environment, um, which was already kind of nascent in this, this community, uh, having lost their industry. And so the project was kind of a, the metaphor was building a nest, you know, use what's abundant and nearby. And, and it, instead of um, a Belgian suburban um, architects, like fireplaces and stuff like that, we have rusty steel and um, slag, you know, byproducts of steel production to reuse. So, so the idea here was to really try to reuse steel for the structure, which is a large component of the embodied carbon in the building. Uh, we didn't use the word embodied carbon then, but um, we knew it was important. 
Um, and doing it is very much of a challenge. Like, is it still structurally sound? It, you know, how do you get this material approved? So this work in this area that, that Oliver was mentioning is really exciting to see that there are more and more um, ways to obtain that kind of reused materials. Um, equal, though, in my mind, is replenishing, repairing, replenishing biodiversity uh, because there has been such a great drop-off and loss. And, and one of the things about cities in North America, especially cities on waterways, they're on these flyways for migratory birds that move all the way from way down to South America all the way up into um, Canada, very far north, and it, it's this incredible event. But the one thing standing between them and their journey is architecture, <laughs> like glass. Um, it, it is the second largest killer of birds, um, right after cats, I guess, is the first largest. But, um, but both of them human caused in a certain way. And like even after one day during migration, this is a collection of birds that uh, were picked up in Chicago. And this, is, this happens every spring and fall. Um, and it's because they're hitting this glass they cannot see navigating by way of, of stars usually, but then city lights end up being there. So this first project was not only about human communities, but it's also about protecting um, other species. This is the kind of screen made out of this recycled steel that, that we were proposing for that uh, community center. So other things that we've been interested in, I'm gonna hit a couple general topics and then go into a couple specific projects. But um, we've been interested, of course, in bio-based materials, which is lower embodied carbon as well, um, through sustainably harvested forests, of course. Um, one project was this Writers Theater in, in Glencoe, Illinois. Um, it's, it's got a kind of civic aspect to it um, where people gather in the small town um, and it's, uh, it has this outdoor walkway that she, that's uh, suspended with wood used in tension. So this is a Port Orford cedar wood that carries a walkway around into the outside, into the canopy um, around it. And the glass you can see on the right is, uh, has these frit that is, makes the glass visible to birds. Um, which we've also used and we've developed a number of things to reduce these hazards uh, for birds in environments. Uh, but this is a really great gathering place for people and it's, it's all done with um, timber uh, construction. Like I said, the walkway hanging in tension. Uh, you can even see the detail here at the base where this little detail called a cat's paw, we called it, um, holds up the walkway going around. Um, another thing we tried, and this was, um, is this cordwood masonry construction. Um, during the design of this Center for Social Justice Leadership, we came across these barns that were built with logs, but not like a log cabin. It was built using masonry, using logs, wood in, in um, masonry type wall. And so this, we started to research this and we found a couple of really interesting hippies that were teaching people how to build uh, their own saunas with this method. And so this project really became about like how can we, um, for a social justice center, tap into this community spirit of building um, and, and use a resource nearby to make a structurally sound um, wall um, using this timber and, um, and lime mortar and, and, but, you know, of course, there's a refinement to it. And what was really exciting is the Masons just picked it right up and they understood um, how to use this right away. And they did it faster than us and faster than our hippie friends. And, and it, they just, like, blew through the walls like, like they'd done it all their lives. Um, so that's really a place for gathering to talk about important issues about um, social justice. And, and it's also built with this very um, carbon sequestering uh, walls, um, slightly curving around in the landscape. Very beautiful. And then uh, more recently, we're currently working on, and it, this is a rendering, it's in construction, is the Harvard Treehouse Conference Center. So this will be Harvard's first 100% um, mass timber uh, project, um, net carbon zero, and using timber in, a more, in the more engineered sense 
that is now available um, for a lot of projects. So those are really fun um, projects that I um, am learning a lot about and just to wanting to take wood in further directions um, in the future. When we talk about repair, though, there's also the aspect of the urban environment that needs attention in cities like Chicago. And I'm kind of focusing on Chicago, but we found that uh, these conditions in many different places. Um, Chicago has this river, it's a really a waterway, a channel uh, that was heavily polluted with sewage that was untreated sewage being released into the river. And, and um, in, I think it was around 2010, we did a study about this uh, sponsored by the Natural Resource Defense Council. And, and the purpose of it was to uh, bring forward and let people know about what was going on with the river. Of course, water quality, bad. Um, the, the fact that houses were getting flooded um, and this continues with, with climate change. The threat of invasive species coming up the Mississippi and making their way into the Great Lakes, which needs to be prevented, but also the potential of all this post-industrial land along the river and what it could become. So the, we did a book about this, and it was really to mobilize people on the issue of the water, um, the water being dumped into the river, and to to uh, support new legislation to control that. Um, but we had to give a vision for what it could be like in the future. Um, and, and one of the things that my takeaway, I guess, was that in order to get people to care about this river, you have to give them access to it, you know, even if it's not in the best shape. So we had these series of steps. And step number one is give people access to the water. Um, luckily, a, a, a mayor of Chicago saw this and and, and who really was in, loved rowing and wanted to give kids uh, opportunities to row on the river. So we designed a boathouse, two boathouses actually, based on uh, the designs, kind of this idea of freezing the motion of rowing. Um, and they um, were built in a quick amount of time and, and really occupied. And what they, the beauty of this is, it's not just about a boathouse, it's really about giving people access to water and, and creating a whole new generation of, of stewards and champions of the river. And, and it's unbelievable, like now, you know, eight, nine years later, it's unbelievable how popular uh, these places have been, how, how um, exciting the river has become, not just because of this project, but, but it, it really is taking hold. Um, so they were done in a very um, modest construction uh, using um, steel, severe and deal frame here occupying the attic, uh, but they have also facilities for working out um, in the winter, um, and, and they're kind of like these gateways to the river now. Um, and so the result of all that is just that the, once this uh, information starts getting out there and you have the support through architecture, I mean, architecture is such a strong uh, tool to get people excited about their environment. Um, and, and they started, the, the city of course voted to clean the water. Um, and if you look today, you just see so many people committed to cleaning the riverfront, to um, wildlife along the river, to recreating along the river. And it's just a t completely changed um, situation. Um, one other kind of urban repair was this nature boardwalk that we designed in uh, Lincoln Park, which is a, it, it's, it's actually a zoo. There's a free zoo in the city and this great big park. Um, and um, they asked us to work on this one pond and do a pavilion to, you know, be like an educational pavilion for uh, students. And the pond was in bad repair. Uh, the edges were broken. As the, the landscape was broken down. And so we, we used that um, opportunity to help our client um, to reimagine the pond. Uh, just forget about the pavilion for now. And what we ended up doing was making this a much deeper, 
ecosystem functioning pond. So it's a kind of stormwater um, retaining pond. It's, it was three feet deep and like one meter, and we went to like three meters deep. And, and so fish can winter over in this pond. We, we just ripped out the edges and, and placed a lot of more um, the, the native grasses and native plants that are food for pollinators and such. And, and in, over the next few years, it just started to transform. And we did design a pavilion. That's it in the background there on the left. And what, but it's the place altogether. It's like the pavilion and the landscape. This project started, it, it, it was, you know, it's a zoo without cages, really. I mean, there are so many birds entering, bats. Um, and the zoo started this program of urban nature uh, study, um, and which is thriving today. They're looking at all studying, taking night cam photos, uh, acoustic measurements of bats. We've seen, you know, coyotes there. These are, you know, big mammals that live right in Chicago. Skunks. I know you guys don't have a lot of mammals here, but like super exciting to see this for me. Um, and they don't eat your dogs either. They're, they're like, they're very good urban animals. <laughs> um, they like rats, so that's good. Um, and then there are also like programs measuring the birds, measuring the different um, turtles that are there. And then of course the, the pavilion itself is a magnet for people and it's very flexible. It can be used for a lot of different things. It, it, it is a very popular wedding venue as well, especially for architects. Um, <laughs> then things happen that you don't expect. Like here, the um, Diné and Blanc just took over the whole boardwalk and, and had a wonderful evening in this setting. So it's completely different, transformed urban space. OK, so now a lot of people maybe in this room might know us for our tall buildings. And so, you know, how does that fit in with um, repair? And I think it, we've always been interested in them because um, of really the compactness of building tall. And it's not always super tall. It's just, you know, a compact building. And, and the first time we got a chance to do that um, was when we were asked to design a tower uh, by a, a Chicago developer. Um, and trying to get our head around it, we, we just worked with um, some of the data and, and found that it, it doesn't work in every city, okay, but in Chicago it's actually quite good because jobs are nearby and people don't spend as much fuel driving around. Um, just to get out of a suburb like this on the right, it, you know, you're spending a lot of fuel and commuting back and forth to jobs. So, so they calculated the carbon that, I, that would be um, equivalent in the two spaces and, and living in this compact environment is quite good. Um, the, the building, the aqua tower was, um, we knew that it had to be concrete. Uh, it was just the only material that could do this, um, 82 st story tower. Um, and it, it really, is a, it's a mixed use project. It's apartments, it's a hotel, it's condominiums. Um, and each and every floor is slightly different as you move up the tower. And, and the reason for this it was, is really based on thinking, like within our studio, how would you want to live if you were living in a tower? And a lot of times people feel isolated, you know, in, um, in towers. Um, and we thought about how this, this form could make it possible for people to be outside and be part of the city and part of the building at the same time. Um, it, it, these differences um, um, are really kind of like a topography on the building turned upright and then let's say sliced <laughs> 82 times. Um, and what they allow you to do is see around corners or see things that you wouldn't normally see, but also connect to others on the tower in a kind of oblique way that is not uncomfortable, um, but, but allows you to um, see each other, um, and people can gather on these, these spaces. Um, I think the first time you go out, it's a little scary, but after you know, you're there for five minutes, it's, it's pretty nice. 
and the idea that you know people could actually get together uh, on the outside of the building. Um, we we also think about the the base of tower. So after Aqua, which was um, 82 stories, we were asked to design another building really right next to it. So if you look to the left, you can see the Aqua Tower and the new tower, St. Regis Tower, um, again designed with people, empty nesters in mind, people that would be coming back into the city. Um, and this time, though, the site was much more prominent. Um, and you can be seen from the river, uh, the Chicago River there, uh, but also from this kind of long axis uh, to the south. Um, and so this, this project became, as you see it along the river, and you see those double-decker highways there, we, we wondered if it would be possible to connect um, through this building on the base and at, the, at multiple ground levels into the park, which is on the other side of it. So, so it, it is a building that is a private building, I guess, but has this public aspect of connection where we... Um, made public access all the way through the base on multiple levels. Um, and, and that's really quite rare in a building, but I think the porosity is, is key for making a building connect to its environment. Um, so p anyone can walk through there. And you know this, this aspect of the river is really, it, it is really helping all these small moves adding up can make a change, which is really exciting. Um, how can a building, taller building, be a good neighbor? And um, here at the Solar Carve Tower in New York City, we had a site along the High Line there. And if we would have built this as of right, um, it, it would be, it, it could hang over the High Line. And, and that's a condition that, because the High Line is kind of in the center of the block and not on the street side, it, people had permission to just lean over it and a lot of people a lot of architects were doing that you know so you could get a view down the high line um, what we did instead was to say that uh, if we the, the left side here you can see is as of right and the shadow that circled is what would have happened to the high line plantings if we would have done it that way so we we, we cut the building based on these solar angles and view sight lines um, and we asked the city if we could build it a little higher if we pulled it off of this. And it ended up having this effect of um, they understood this logic and, and they eventually put regulations in place that are not unlike this project's um, reaction to the site. So in a way, this project helped to move the needle on um, how you would design along the High Line for the future. So these carvings um, that are based on sun angles and views are, are um, articulated with a different kind of curtain wall, a, a kind of faceted curtain wall that gives a special space on the inside as well. And the high ceilings also allow there to be a, a displacement uh, ventilation that, that keeps the, uh, the floors um, cooler. Now, this is a weird project for us because we didn't know who was going to be in this building. So it, it's very different than some of the other projects where we really get to know the, the users. Um, but I think we found a way to make it particularly about that place. And finally, in, in, in San Francisco, we were awarded a project to design a tower in the city that's got amazing hills and views and all these bay windows. Um, and what we were aiming for here is just to, to celebrate the bay window, so from inside out, and how you can have different angles of light when you have these bay windows. So it's really driven by that inside out feeling. Um, again, this kind of natural, this um, movement that you get in growth, natural growth. Um, and this project, because it has lots of um, ledges and soffits, I guess you could say, um, we were able to do a prefabricated cladding, um, and it's insulated and waterproof cladding, which made the construction faster and, and, and more. And so there is there's a kind of logic to it. There's a certain amount of types, and they're repeated. Um, and then they were able to 
um, build it up faster. So inside you get many different light angles and views. I want to say though this project is like 40% um, affordable housing as well. So because uh, San Francisco is very progressive and 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 all the affordable units are just integrated in with the unaffordable units. <laughs> um, but um, uh, it, it's a kind of a nice approach to getting a, a nice mix of housing um, together in a, in a city. Um, and that's that. Okay, so now I'm just coming to the, the last uh, part of this talk, which is, you know, we looked at um, biosource materials, we looked at reusing materials. I like to think about Rome as the classics, you know, reusing materials of spolia. Um, but when um, I started to teach uh, students how do you reuse brutalist buildings, that's what I've been working on the last five years at, at the GSD, um, and um, realized that the, the language is kind of emptied out. There's not a lot of exciting words to talk about reuse um, and to talk about recycling, reuse, and, and there's the terms are all mixed up. So. So what um, we started to do is focus on this idea of grafting. So it's, it's really about reusing whole buildings. Uh, so that's the studio work at the GSD, but also some of our uh, most recent work. And if you look at the carbon emissions by uh, building type and materials, you can see that renovations are a lot less um, embodied carbon, uh, much less than, than other types of reuse and recycling and those kinds of things. Um, so this book that I just finished, it should be available in April, called The Art of Architectural Grafting, is really about trying to refresh this idea and to think about horticultural grafting, which is a really an age-old practice of not only reusing things, but making them flourish. Um, um, how can we apply some of those ideas to architecture? Not all forms of reuse and renovation are equal. Okay, so the, this graph, I'm sorry it's so small, um, but um, they, have, they represent different levels of carbon. So, you know, the, the best way to save carbon is delaying the demolition, demolition, which is the not build at all option. Next best, though, is increasing the intensity of use. So that means, you know, can we use the buildings 24 seven, can there be more added to them? Can they be more vibrant instead of building brand new? Um, and then, you know, you can see things at the bottom. Some people think that we should be designing for dis disassembly, but you know, that falls pretty low in terms of like how much carbon is saved. And this is all because it's urgent to save carbon emissions by 2030. So we're, we have to really address this now, it's very fast. Grafting, of course, is an ancient art. This is a third century mosaic of showing uh, some guys out there grafting fruit trees um, in the field. Um, and it provides a lot of interesting um, ideas. Um, and I think we can look to the past and see projects that we could say are grafted. So the idea here is just to try to make the language more precise. Um, it started for us with this Prentice Hospital that was going to be torn down by the architect um, Bertrand Goldberg. Um, so he had done this hospital that was a uh, cloverleaf in plan, and the nurses were in, it's a nurses in the center, so there was no core in the center. But they wanted to tear this down and put up a, a kind of new building. So we did a project without a client to show how you might reuse that center area as a core um, to grow a new tower to accommodate their needs on the same site using the same building. It wasn't uh, adopted, let's just say. <laughs> the building was turned down. But it got us thinking about like, how to reuse things in this like, a little bit more radical way. Um, a project for a that was a dormitory built in 1953 uh, in, on a New York Long Island campus. We were asked to reimagine it as a biotech research innovation lab. So we convinced the client to keep the, the brick building, the single story building, and add the additional space for the ventilation and for light and air in this. So it's all 
wood construction, lightweight, grafted onto these concrete beams to create this much higher space that accommodates the program. Um, at Beloit College, we used a, um, an old coal-burning power plant um, for the Beloit College to, to create three programs, recreation center, health center, and a student union. I love the irony of a coal-burning power plant as a health center. I just love that. Okay, but it's such a generous building. It was pretty. It was kind of easy to get all these uses inside and fun. Um, you know, you can see the hoppers being used as climbing walls, uh, the building being used as a pool, and and then the new addition being used for um, field uh, a field house. Um, and there's so much structure inside these things that you can put more floors, you can use it in a much more intense way, and you would never be able to do that from scratch, I don't think. Okay, so these two last projects I want to talk about is the um, Arkansas Museum of Fine Art and then the American Museum of Natural History, which are both, in my mind, uh, examples of a kind of grafting in architecture. Um, uh, the Museum of Fine Art, this is in Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, is a, it was a competition um, to, I guess, fix this building, which was built in, it, it was a mess. I mean, it, it really was. It was built like eight different uh, editions, every single thing with different styles, but it, no sense to the circulation. Eight different structural systems, eight more than eight different mechanical systems, and so the the move here was it, it it was really a precise editing, a cut down the middle, and some a removal of a few things just to give a clear circulation spine to this uh, campus. Um, the dark in the sketch, the dark part there was the original building. 1937. Um, and then again, like there's this movement and connecting really out into the park for the first time uh, to the north and to the south uh, to make the museum open up to its landscape, connecting people to the landscape and, and giving more light and air inside. So today, now this is just finished um, last year, um, you come into this courtyard and you can see the original facade, um, and it's protected by this new uh, living room, if you will, on the second floor that you walk underneath, and that provides a kind of social space for uh, the users. And on the right-hand side, you can see um, one of those eight additions had enough capacity to hold another whole floor, so we used it and put another whole level of gallery spaces above that. Um, shown, this is the front gallery shown here. And so the, from the outside, you have this new entrance and announcement. You have um, a kind of exterior garden space on the back on the left with restaurant um, and places to convene and to circulate in a very clear way. So it was really, I, I love this project. It, it, it was very challenging. Even just getting um, the, um, all the parts to become white, was just so it looked like one building, was, was also not easy. Um, um, but I think the, the overall result came out really nicely, and um, the city is, is using it in, in a very robust way today. So it's really now a museum sitting in a park, um, and instead of a, a collection of different um, ad hoc things. <laughs> okay, um, and finally, um, I wanted to show you the Gilder Center, the American Museum of Natural History, a uh, project that was 10 years in the making. Again, a campus, a campus that, um, that yellow dot is where the, the new wing uh, is to sit, but this is the way it looked when we came to the project. Central Park is on the upper right-hand side of the slide, um, and then this is a, a, a small park that's adjacent to Central Park. So here, um, it was again, it was a competition, and I think our approach was 
was really to pull this in to the center and to use the new wing to clarify circulation, to clarify the visitor's movement. The number one request, let's say, by the, the museum was that they wanted to stop frustrating their visitors and um, they would get into these dead ends and get lost. And so um, our idea was just to kind of keep this central hub of which is a theater and to um, continue the circulation while acknowledging um, the existing um, anomalies, let's say, that were built over time. Um, in the past, of course, natural history uh, was about putting research and collections um, out so the public could see it, but, but in, a, in a way that was arranged by type. Um, and this, this is really um, one of the other big challenges, like how to bring the collections, make them come alive for people, and to um, encourage people to want to become researchers or become scientists. And so it's, it's really a museum for not only uh, the public, it's for students, school kids, it's for teachers, parents, and it, they even grant PhDs at this university. So our idea here was to create this kind of accessible ground level entry, um, which would be um, tapping into existing circulation routes. I think like 30 additional connections were made to existing buildings. Um, bring the collections forward, the theater, and a lot of classrooms. So, so a lot of, there's um, 15 classrooms in the wing. There's an exposed um, collections core that was already there and we just like, revealed it and a new theater. And so there were very few places we could put loads on the existing structure. And so the way that this design developed was, was about like how to create a structure that would sit on the existing points but also be provide enough holes and perforations for people to find their way through. Um, and so in that sense, it really is like a landscape in that it's, it's something that you want to explore and discover. You would never see this project like this image right here. That's on the inside, and that is the structure holding all the floors of the building. So um, you can see better in this section how this weird structure uh, sits down onto the existing columns and then holds the floors coming into it. Um, and so in that sense, it really is like a, a landscape that is you know, taking the materials taken away where it's not needed um, and also hopefully making people feel the sense of discovery like you have in caves and canyons. One of the fun parts was going out west uh, just to study canyons for a little while before starting this project. Um, and then using kind of tools, both really digital tools, we had to have our own software kind of customized, but also very analog tools. Like in Chicago, you can just make models out of ice because it's so cold outside that um, you just uh, melt it away. Um, and then digitizing these kind of eroded ice mo models. Um, and then, you know, really studying if you only use software, like off-the-shelf software, you would get a very blobby form. Um, but we really wanted it to have these qualities, like those creases, and, and, and um, the form of it was very important. And also, all these loads have to come down to the ground. So there's a lot of interesting things about the construction here as well that I won't um, get to go into right now. But it's, it's made of shotcrete. So, uh, uh, that structure is created out of rebar, and then um, scaffolding is built inside. This is a, they start at the top and shoot the concrete into the uh, rebar, and then teams of um, workers, mostly guys, but let's just say workers in case <laughs> they were mixed. They were they would go across um, and and scrape the um, concrete into the rebar, and and with with high level of precision. It's the same construction that is used on subway tunnels um, under Manhattan. Um, so it was really fun to see a building kind of get revealed from the top down. That was weird for me. <laughs> um, and, and to see how people are inhabiting it now, it has a lot of really engaging um, spaces. And it's one of the only places in New York where you can just hang out um, and look down the axis of 
of one of the uh, streets in New York, in Manhattan's grid. Um, it, and there's lots of places to sit for people too, because again, the point is like, how can you get people talking about what they've seen? Uh, this is the collections core, one floor of it, it continues up. Um, and then the library, which is an exhibition space in itself, because they have such amazing rare books. But this is one of those columns that had to go all the way through the building. So it's, it's stretching out its beams there, almost in the kind of mushroomy way. Um, and then with these amazing views that you get to the park and across the central atrium. There are living exhibits in here. These are um, leafcutter ants, if you get a chance to go. It's a, a colony that um, you can see them on the left carrying their leaves into creating their, um, their nests and fermenting the leaves. Um, and then this axial entry um, that, that's aligned with 79th Street. So on the outside, this canyon kind of wraps out and becomes um, the facade. It gets insulated and then stone um, cladding. The stone cladding is really from the original quarry that the um, entry at the opposite side of the museum is made with. Uh, we were able to reopen that quarry and, and get the same stone to connect it to this landmark campus. Um, the project had to pass through many, many, many um, approvals and hurdles, but we tried to very carefully connect it to its neighbors. I, I don't really see it as, I see it in dialogue with these um, historic neighbors and in, in various ways, and that's part of what uh, the grafting um, technique has to do with, you know, how do you create these dialogues um, between not only between the buildings, but in a way it's between the authors of, you know, the, an asynchronous collaboration with someone who built something a long time ago. Um, here's the new park, and here again is the axis along 79th Street. So I don't think there's another place like this in the city. And it's very special because, um, like Neil deGrasse Tyson, who is the astrophysicist who leads their department there, um, has coined the term Manhattan Henge, which is like the two times um, when the sun goes down along the axis of Manhattan. And so um, we hope that in the future that people will be able to observe that phenomena. It's a way it's like connecting the museum to uh, something outside of itself, even, even the city and even the solar system. Um, so it's about connections. And um, with that, I want to thank you very much. Thank you. Amazing, thank you so much, Jeannie. I love this idea of architectural grafting. I think that's a, a fantastic term for what otherwise is known as retrofit, yes. <laughs> very unglamorous. Um, and actually, I wanted to start with that question, because I can imagine often you're approached by clients who want a very you know, flashy, new, shiny you know, piece of architecture. Mm -hmm. How do you convince them to actually go down the reuse option? Like, What are your main arguments when you're trying to mm. persuade them to keep as much of the existing fabric as possible? You know, sometimes I think, I don't know if that's 100% in the architect's um, realm of possibilities. It's some, like, because somebody might have a site with nothing on it, or they might just, you know, have a blank site oftentimes. Um, but if there is a building, we can first see what the structure can do, because that, that's like the most crucial piece. And if the structure has capacity in it, there's probably savings uh, for them to use. If it's more like you want to keep it because it's old, it, they're, they're not, you know, it's harder to convince. But I think as uh, Lactan Vassal pointed out, there is so much value in a structure if it does have that extra capacity. So it's important to get that structural analysis as well right away. Yeah. yeah. <sighs> okay, well, we have some really interesting questions from the audience. And actually the most popular one, you might be surprised to know, is what is your favorite bird? <laughs> ah, you mean here? And I think, well, gosh, that is a great question. Um, <laughs> I, I think my favorite one here is the New Zealand blue duck, okay. which I actually got to see in the wild. Amazing. Yes. You just come back from a tour of seeing, of yes. doing some bird watching. Uh, yes, I did. And, um, but there are, it's, 
it's interesting. Like I even I like all birds and just even like pigeons. I mean, <laughs> but I just like living things. Um, but every single bird has its own like peculiarities. So I think that's why it's so fun as an architect if you travel around. It's something you can do in every city, yeah. every place. <laughs> well, following on from that, I was interested. You, know, you started your presentation sharing this kind of horrific scene of dead birds from oh, all yeah. of the high rises. How have you managed to mitigate that in some of your own glass mm -hmm. buildings, like the St. Regis Tower and the one on the High Line? Yeah. Uh, one thing that they see is um, you can make a building bird visible, I guess. So you have better luck with something like Aqua Tower than a very slick or transparent, you know, um, tower. So if it has texture, and with the, the St. Regis, we used um, a variegated glass, a kind of um, um, changing six different types of glass that change in color and it moves in and out. So there's, there's texture to it, there's visibility to it, which ends up helping to reduce. Um, another thing is like just with glass um, handrails, which are very common, we usually use the frit on those if we use glass handrails. But if you use picket handrails, they can see that. <laughs> exactly. Is it something that's taking <laughs> off for architects getting more? sophisticated about the, the bird bird flight issue? I, I, it's just like with sustainability, I think it needs regulation. Like So in New York City, we have regulation. In San Francisco, we have regulation. In Chicago, we're still fighting for that regulation. But it, it seems to be that you know those kinds of things need to be somewhat mandated, and then you see it take off. So yeah. right now, it's just, you know, again, us architects, we have to convince our clients to do these things. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we have a question that says that there is a proverb that says the greatest time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. Oh, yes. The second best time is today. What initiatives would you invest time into now? Hmm. Great question. <laughs> I don't know who teed that up for me, but um, um, it, it just so happens that this rust belt, the, the, because we all need more, at least in North America, we can do um, wood buildings, not in every place can you make wood buildings. But uh, we need wood, and we only have wood in the northeast and the south, the southeast and the northwest. So um, right now we're working on projects to uh, phytoremediate polluted lands with urban forests that can then also be, you know, slotted to uh, help product, um, help create wood products for architects, architects and builders closer to the city where you need it. Okay. Um, this is an interesting one about tall buildings. Was there any wind design parameters and constraints uh, when you were designing the curvy facade of the mm. Aqua Tower, oh, especially yeah. in the windy city? Oh, yeah. Um, the, that variety, again, a variety on the facade with the uh, balconies moving in and out actually helps to confuse the wind. So it, it makes them more comfortable so you can use them a longer time during the year. Um, so, but yes, you have to, wind is like, Chicago is very windy, but every city, once you build tall, the winds are higher speeds at higher um, heights. And so it requires wind testing. So, but again, variety, different heights, like in St. Regis, uh, the blow through floor, and then like at Aqua it was these various balconies that helped reduce that. With the Highline project, does that kind of faceted side also help avoid that canyon wind tunnel effect? Yes, it does. After we tested it, it wasn't really the purpose of the facets, but um, it does help ameliorate that. Um, <laughs> we have someone asking, what's a central principle within your practice that applies to the duality of concrete skyscrapers on the one hand and repaired uh -huh. natural landscapes on the other? Yeah, um, well, I guess I would answer that like, we have a population of 8 billion people and it's growing. So we have to find ways to build more, you know, more housing, more density. And, and I think not building is not an answer. Uh, that, that just doesn't work for where we are right now with our uh, population. So we have to figure out ways to do it better, keep people in a more dense area of the city, uh, make it wonderful to live like that. and. And so I feel like if we can make strides, even with the types of concrete we use on that building type, that's, that's very important because it's at such a big scale. At the same time, there's um, 
you know, the scale of the city that's more about the landscape and more about um, the lower rise buildings and how we can make those more sustainable. So I don't separate them. I think them of them all as part of this, you know, push to, to make our environments more sustainable. We have quite a technical <laughs> question here, if you're willing to okay. give away your trade secret, uh -oh. which is what software do you use for these <laughs> complex forms? Uh, well, it, they're kind of like plugins to, you know, you, you use um, Rhino and things like that, but you, you can get customized plugins to give you some of those um, nice crisp creases that I was talking about in there. Um, so everyone, I mean, but we probably use the same thing as everyone else is, is just like Rhino and all the others. You have quite a big but I don't actually draw, oops, sorry. I don't actually draw on the computer anymore. <laughs> so. <laughs> Do you now have quite a big in-house team specifically developing those software tools? Um, I wouldn't say it's a big team, but you know, we work with outside consultants to like when we have an issue we can't solve, um, we work with consultants in, in software industry to help us get to where we need to go. Yeah. Um, this next question, I think, is probably coming from professional envy, which is how did you build your client pay base to get these kinds of prominent oh. projects? Oh, it, it's like a lot of that is luck. I mean, for the Aqua Tower, for example, I was sitting next to the developer at one of those kind of boring alumni dinners. <laughs> and he was saying he was developing a big project and, and it asked me if I'd like to come over and you know, see what they were doing. Um, and you know, a couple of weeks later, he called me and said, do we like to come over? And I thought, oh, maybe they want us to do some interior or something. So I go over there with my big portfolio and, and, he, and he said basically, he says, I already know what you, your work is. Let's get started. I mean, the, like sometimes it's that lucky, that random, and other times it's such a hard competitive uh, landscape. So, I mean, yeah, it's, it's like you gotta take the opportunities. I, I didn't know if I was ever gonna do a tall building or if I even wanted to, but then I thought about it and it was like, this is a great opportunity to try some things on that scale. So even like a boring project seemingly boring too could be a great project I think and so it's when we when we sit around and we think nowadays luckily we can say no to projects but we try to evaluate like where can this project move the needle you know how committed is the owner to doing something or are they like an owner that wants to do something but doesn't know how and you can really help them get over the hump so a lot of those things come into the decisions. Yeah, yeah. Okay, with all the challenges climate change poses, what are the approaches Studio Gang has to creating climate resilient buildings and socially resilient communities? Mm -hmm. Well, that's kind of what I was talking about throughout all of the projects, but it, I think the, the idea is um, to, to design for communities, you have to first know the communities so it, it really takes some effort to engage with communities and I, I really enjoy that part. Um, and, and to understand, a lot of times the community knows what they need more than you do as the architect coming in you know, from the outside. So it's kind of about listening to what they already know and, and then um, finding what's available and what is, what is attainable, what's already there. Start with what's there. And so that's a good way to decide what kind of materials you're going to use or um, what kind of sustainable approach you're going to use because um, it, it's no good trying to import something from very far away on, on a project. It, you know, really use the local knowledge. Yeah, yeah. Something that follows on from that is an interesting question, uh, which has just disappeared. Um, <laughs> Are there applications of your grafting approach to the problem of American suburban housing? Ooh, I haven't tried that yet, but I liked how it looked with the Belgian uh, examples that you showed. Um, um, Is that you a, know, a, an area you'd be interested to tackle? We get a kind of unglamorous world of American suburban yeah. tract housing, how it can actually be meaningfully densified or retrofitted. Yeah. I mean, it's a problem that you guys obviously face a lot here. I, I think that 
it's more a problem of densifying it than than grafting onto it. You know, the, the, it, making a more intensity of use um, because there it's just too much. It's in a way it's too much space. So how could some of those building types in suburban housing types become more extended families or non-related uh, families? How could it just do more than what it's doing right now is probably the way to go. I mean, they're already big, so it's not like they need more space. Um, I think that would be a really interesting project to try. Uh, not, I haven't done it yet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe our next GSD studio. Yeah. Uh, and finally, as a provocation, having been here for, I guess, what, 24 hours, maybe slightly more, what are your thoughts on Auckland's built fabric? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I haven't. I, I think I'm staying in the nicest part, and it is very impressive down at the Britomart area. Um, and I think the the waterfront is extremely has huge potential, and it's um, so. In a way, it's a lot like other, um, let's say, North American cities that built up quickly, and. You know, it, it needs to, I would say, the building fabric has some positive things, has some nice historic things, and, and it needs um, some something that's really about this place. And that, that's what I was thinking about when I was walking around, like how could you make a, a building that is talks to this specific site and the people who live here? Uh, and because right now I see a lot of like just copying tropes, you know, tropes that are, as soon as a project is published, it's like everyone starts copying the same thing. So, and that just makes it generic. So, you know, how could it be something from really here? And I would be looking at um, materials and like how people use space to try to suss that out. Any developers in the audience, please take note. <laughs> Great, well before our momentous book giveaway, can we please thank Jeannie yeah. Gang and the sponsor, uh, Metalcraft Roofing. Go over here now.